The coup in Niger. What's ahead as the crisis continues? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu, and this is The Heat. It's been more than three weeks now since a military coup ousted Niger's president, Mohamed Bazoum. Since then, he's been in detention, while the 15-member West African regional bloc, also known as ECOWAS, has called for his reinstatement. The coup seems to have strong support, but its leaders face a threat of military intervention by ECOWAS. Defence chiefs from the group met in Accra on Thursday, and the bloc says most of its member states stand ready to take part in a standby force that could intervene in Niger if diplomatic efforts to reverse the coup fail. Meanwhile, the coup leaders have called for the deposed President Bazoum to be prosecuted for treason. Let's get to our panel of Africa experts to talk about all of this. With me here in the studio is Kingsley Mohalu. He is a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Joining us too from Abuja, Nigeria, is David Otto Endele. He is director of the Geneva Center for Africa Security and Secure Strategic Studies. Also with us from Paris is French Algerian journalist Nabila Ramdani. And joining the discussion too here in Washington, D.C., is Abdullah Boru Halake. He is an Africa security and policy analyst. Welcome to all of you. Kingsley, let's start right here in the studio. There have been significant developments in the past 24 hours in this crisis. ECOWAS says it now stands ready to intervene militarily if diplomatic efforts fail to reverse the coup in Niger. There have also been media reports. We've seen it in Le Monde, the French newspaper, as well as the French television network France 24, that is reporting that the African Union, which has been meeting, does not support any military intervention. So it would seem that the AU and ECOWAS is at odds on how to deal with this. Where does that now leave things? Well, you know, we have the gathering storm of what could be called the first African world war. Um, the, you know, another very important development is that the, the junta... That's pretty serious, calling it a world war. Well, you know, there's so many forces, mm -hmm. uh, interests involved, the African Union, ECOWAS, um, America, France, you know, so, so many, so many countries uh, have a stake in what's going on in Niger. But a very important development also is that the junta has indicated its willingness to talk um, with ECOWAS, and that's an important fact that has shifted the reality on the ground. What ECOWAS is doing is to give cred you know, credibility to its threat to use force without going gung-ho as they seemed originally inclined to into the use of force because, of course, in Nigeria, its most important um, member and military power, uh, there's a popular opposition against Nigerian troops going into Niger. So, so this is what we have. And the fact that the, uh, the, the junta has indicated that they're willing to talk is very important. And I believe that ECOWAS should I seize this opportunity mm -hmm. to impress on them the, the, that it's mutually beneficial for all involved yeah. for this matter to be peacefully uh, resolved. Because for Niger itself, it's bad if there's an intervention. It's going to be destructive. Uh, for the ECOWAS countries, especially for Nigeria, a military intervention in ECOWAS could have very serious internal political ramifications in Nigeria. And, and I think that if that can be avoided, it's best. Now, Concerning the gap, apparent gap, between the OAU, uh, sorry, the African Union, and I'm showing my age there <laughs> when I talk about the OAU. Well, even I know who they are. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, when you have uh, the, 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 the gap, the apparent gap between the African Union and the ECOWAS, I think that's a bit unfortunate and just creates a, a very, very um, untidy complication in terms of Africa's response uh, to, to the crisis. But like I said, except I don't see the survival of this junta in any scenario for a long term. You know, it's about not if, but when they will give way. And, you know, also whether or not there is any chance to reinstate President Bazoum. I think those are the two issues on the table. Um, but, but the junta has no chance 
to survive in the long term. Um, and I think that, you know, it's to discuss the terms of their disengagement without too much loss of faith. Mm -hmm. And we have seen the very important influence of religious and cultural ties with the interventions of Nigerian religious leaders mm -hmm. visiting uh, the junta right. uh, first was uh, my, my former boss and friend, um, um, uh, Muhammad Sanusi II, the, second, uh, the former emir of Kanu and the former governor of the Nigerian Central Bank, yeah. who leads the Isla Tijaniya movement, okay. who visited and had access, and then now another group of religious leaders. This seems to have opened up the junta to change its stance. Okay. Yes. David, great to have you with us. Um, if diplomatic efforts fail and uh, then we have a military intervention, under what legal authority does ECOWAS act? I mean, it is an economic grouping, as its name suggests, but is there some kind of military protocol attached to this? Well, um, there is no um, legal backing or military protocol. Um, you know, I think. Uh, what we experience in here um, is a push uh, towards, um, you know, some kind of a disassociation to the use of a military force. Um, we know that ECOWAS has used military intervention in the past uh, in countries like Gambia, being the latest in mm -hmm. 2017. Um, they've done the same under ECOMOG uh, previously. Um, but, but I think, you know, um, what we're facing now, um, as my co-panelists introduced, um, is a possible scenario for a push towards um, some kind of a negotiation and dialogue, of, of which uh, the military junta has indicated, you know, some high level of readiness. Now, we're not very sure, um, you know, if ECOWAS will entertain that. Um, but since, you know, the Nigerian junta has made it clear that mm -hmm. wants to dialogue, as opposed to the position that it had previously of refusing uh, to receive some of the emissaries from ECOWAS, um, it's a clear indication that, you know, we must shield our swords um, and move towards a process uh, whereby we could have, you know, some dialogue and negotiations, you know, perhaps towards some kind of a restoration of democracy. I'm not sure that we would have uh, President Bazoum reinstated uh, uh, as ECOWAS wants. Uh, and that is why countries like the United States, you know, have begun to shift their language, you know, mm -hmm. towards a peaceful settlement. Now, what that effectively means mm -hmm. Um, is that, you know, we're looking towards um, an election process, you know, whereby they could propose a short period of time, six months to a year, whereby they can hold an election. But I don't see ECOWAS meeting up to the threat of a military intervention. It's too expensive, it's too, you know, unpredictable, and there is no support, you know, from the continent, from the right. region. Um, but also, you know, from, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask you, in the absence of any kind of legal authority to intervene in this, could it also be seen as an illegal invasion of a sovereign country? Well, um, there is no legality or justification for one country to invade another. Yeah. Um, we have seen that in the case of uh, uh, Russia being pounded you yeah. know, by the international community for invading right. Ukraine, irrespective of the justification. So there is no legal justification for a coup. Yeah. Uh, there is also no legal justification for ECOWAS to intervene in the Niger Republic, which is a sovereign state. Yeah. Nabila, great to have you with us. Welcome to the show. As ECOWAS decides on its involvement in Niger, um, and if it does intend to use military force, wouldn't it be acting against the interests of Nigerians? I mean, we have seen them take to the streets in their thousands in support of the coup. In fact, uh, Reuters news agency quoted one resident in the capital as saying, ECOWAS is being manipulated by foreign powers. These are coordinated actions between France and ECOWAS, uh, according to this report in Reuters. And you've written a piece in the Guardian newspaper in which you say France's quasi-empire is finally crumbling. So how do you see this? Well, I certainly think that uh, ECOWAS uh, has uh, already uh, issued um, you know, a, a warning, uh, asking, uh, requesting even for the restoration of the deposed President Bazoum uh, to uh, go back to power and effectively for the military uh, junta to, to just uh, uh, give up. Um, that deadline has long passed. Uh, we have seen no military action since. I think, as the other uh, panelists have pointed out, 
uh, this could lead to a very dangerous situation of an all-out regional conflict. Uh, certainly, as far as foreign powers are concerned, uh, America and indeed France, uh, their language is very much subdued at the moment. It's very clear that France is very much aligned uh, with the deposed President Bazoum. Uh, the Americans are also saying that they want the restoration to what they call constitutional order. Uh, so there's no appetite from Western nations to get involved militarily. I think they do have an idea that it could trigger uh, a regional uh, conflict. Um, but uh, certainly uh, there are uh, lots of um, um, uh, things happening, not least of all, um, you know, uh, the very fact that there has been little bloodshed involved in the coup itself uh, uh, led or meant that uh, protesters or Ni Nigerians are very much supportive of it. Uh, if it wasn't the case, you would see protests, more protests asking for, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the junta to, to, to leave power. That hasn't been the, hasn't been the case yet. Abdullahi, um, do you believe that this latest threat of force would perhaps persuade the military junta to get to the negotiating table sooner rather than later? Potentially, but I think the reality is like all the panelists spoke about. On the surface of it, it might seem that all the actors that are pushing the junta to relinquish power are reading from the same script. But, you know, on a closer reading, it doesn't seem to be like that. France and ECOWAS are on one side. You have the United States that is very unclear. And I think as of this morning, their position, probably even yesterday, their position is that, uh, without stating that very obviously because of legal ramification, because uh, the State Department, once a situation is determined to have been a coup, all military and non-military support will cease. And that includes the biggest asset in the region, which is the drone center that the United States spent at least 110 million to build. So the United for United States, they can deal with any other person as long as it can retain its, you know, military cooperation. Yeah, sure, the law has a waiver where that can be declared. Yeah. But I think that is what we need to be um, to be aware of. Secondly, for the ECOWAS, I think they made the strategic era at the beginning, the era, sorry, at the beginning, which they used the first instance being the military. And now, you know, they are considerably weakened and they keep on, you know, moving backwards from where their position initially was. Great statement of Bazoom, you know, the coup leaders need to step down. The reality is this will end in some sort of political negotiations and that will not be a perfect deal like my one of my panelists said that we might see this go on for a year or six months after which there will be an election and that election might not necessarily mean that but zoom or his administration might be reinstated we might have an election so i think there is a lot to watch in this space and we are to my mind at the early stages of this because for ECOWAS, the last thing you want is for the medicine to cause more problem than the disease that they are trying to cure. Kingsley, one other development that we've been hearing about is that the military junta has now threatened to prosecute Mohamed Bazoum, the ousted president, for treason. Um, how serious is this threat? I, I would consider it grandstanding okay. um, because the question is who should be prosecuted for treason? Is it the president that you overthrew, or you who broke the constitutional order to overthrow him. So that, I would consider that more of grandstanding. But let me uh, call our minds mm -hmm. to something very important in this whole matter. And that is the ethnic um, dimensions of what's happening in Niger. Niger is about 53% Hausa, the ethnic group, the Hausas. Um, Bazoum, is, I think, a Tuareg, they're less than 1% of the population. There are some Fulani and some Kanuri. Now, I think that the military junta, if there is a negotiation and they agree to um, a negotiated settlement in which in six months or a year there is an election, it's very unlikely, having woken up the genie, um, that, you know, the ethnic background of Bazoum 
will be the ones to emerge as the leaders of Niger. I think this is a very important factor. I think the price that the junta will try to extract mm -hmm. for stepping back is that they will try to ensure that in any democratic process, the majority of the population, the candidate that the majority of the population is ethnically aligned to, will emerge as the next leader of Niger. That is how I see it. But the prosecution of Bazoum, uh, I think it's more grandstanding. Um, you know, there is a negotiation going on. And if they do that, mm. if they prosecute Bazoum, or if any harm comes to Bazoum, I think it raises the stakes uh, for a military intervention. Um, now, the stakes are extremely high right. in Niger, and that is why the, the junta also um, is beginning to realize, you know, the, the drone center of the Americans, the French military presence, the American military presence, the gas pipeline that goes from Nigeria through Niger to Algeria, and, you know, there, is, there are so powerful, and, and the Western powers want this gas pipeline to be their alternative source to anything that passes through Russia. Nigeria needs this gas pipeline to become operational so that it stops depending on crude oil. So they're very, there's a powerful cocktail of economic and strategic interests in Niger. And this is why the response to Niger is very different to the response to Burkina Faso, the response to Mali. Mm. There were platitudes, you know, put out and all that, but nobody threatened to invade anybody. But Niger is just so different, mm. you know. It's just too strategic. It's at the crossroads of so many interests right. that are very powerful and compelling uh, for, for the nations behind those interests that that's why I say the junta has no chance of remaining in power. Whether or not the citizens of Niger back them as it seems they are very popular, yes. but nevertheless, um, because they, they did a coup, which is unconstitutional, mm -hmm. against the stipulations of ECOWAS. Now, somebody raised the matter of the legality or non-legality of an ECOWAS invasion. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that. Mm -hmm. It's not one nation invading Niger. It would be an international organization. So the real issue that may arise is whether or not ECOWAS has the legal authority as an international organization. Mind you, there is a precedent. They've done ECOMOG in, in Sierra Leone and the, uh, uh, in Liberia. So, you know, possession is nine-tenths of the law. But, is, but didn't ECOMOG have legal backing? Uh, of course, I think it had legal backing. Yeah. I believe it did. On the, you know, now, mm -hmm. the issue then would then arise. Yeah. Is okay. there the need for United Nations authorization on right. Article 7 for the use of force? Right. So these are important legal issues, but, okay. but they're less important than the real politic at this time. Okay, let me go to David. David, what do you make of uh, Kingsley's analysis uh, of the possibility of uh, a diplomatic resolution to this crisis down the road, uh, given the ethnic composition of Niger that he talked about? Uh, well, um, the ethnic uh, composition is something that, um, uh, of course, you know, one needs to pay attention to that. Um, but that is down the road. Um, yeah. You know, these are not very clear facts, you know, in terms of uh, uh, what we're seeing on the ground. I think um, at this point in time, you know, the focus is uh, on how do we get uh, the military junta to, uh, you know, revert back to a democratic process. Um, that would mean uh, preparing for... Uh, you know, national elections. And, you know, the hope is that whoever wins uh, the election, um, you know, takes, you know, the other of the day. Um, the issue of ethnicity is something that cuts across the continent. I mean, every country in Africa that you go, uh, there are ethnic issues, you know, so it's nothing new in terms of uh, uh, those realizations. Um, just going back a little bit on what my colleague said, you know, in terms of uh, uh, ECOWAS going into countries like the Gambia, and going to countries like um, Sierra Leone and Liberia. Of course, you know, um, you know you, you, these are very different circumstances. And they have, you know, ECOWAS has never been a military um, regional body. It is an economic body, you know, as the name goes. Um, so in terms of legality, um, you know, there is no legal, um, you know, article that backs ECOWAS from uh, or to uh, launch a military operation. Um, you know, um, so, you know, I think, you know, what ECOWAS is doing is simply trying to protect the West African economic community. Nabila, um, let's talk about the French involvement in Niger right now. France has 1,500 troops in Niger. It maintains a policy known as Franc Afrique, and this policy is maintained across West Africa. What is France's relationship with this 
part of the world, uh, not just with Niger, but all those countries that were former colonies in West Africa. I mean, could it be fairly described as neo-colonial? And if there is to be some kind of diplomatic dispensation down the road, will that, will those circumstances, the French relationship with this part of the world, come to, have to come to an end? Yes, absolutely. I mean, what the uh, Niger coup has revealed is a very a strong anti-French uh, sentiment in Niger, uh, but also across the sub-Saharan Afri uh, African continent uh, because of those uh, policies that you referred to as uh, France-Afrique. Um, France-Afrique effectively refers to um, uh, the fact that former uh, I mean, Niger has become independent from France uh, in, in 1960, but uh, France has ne never gave up uh, really uh, on Niger as a dependent nation. That means that Niger remains dependent on France, just as Niger was dependent on France during uh, the empire, uh, simply because France has restructured former colonial relationships into a neo-colonial nexus across sub-Saharan Africa, uh, including Niger, uh, a network known as France-Afrique, which effectively encompasses uh, economic, political, um, security, uh, cultural uh, ties and alliances centered on, on the French language uh, and the French values. So effectively, the French wanted to hold on to their strategic military basis, as well as energy resources. They wanted to hold on to favorable trade deals, and they also wanted to hold on to financial control. That is why, as you mentioned, we still have uh, 1,500 uh, troops uh, in French garrisons in, in Niger. That's why we still have uh, military and governmental advisors from Paris who have permeated successive Nigerian uh, administrations, including uh, the one that has just been deposed. This is also why, you know, uh, uh, the French uh, French remains the uh, official language in Niger, uh, in in the group of nations uh, called the, referred to as the Francophonie. And crucially, I would contend that the most enduring legacy of French colonialism is the CFA franc, yeah. uh, African Financial Community franc, and that allowed France to retain monetary hegemony over several African states. But the truth is, Nigerians, as many Africans, uh, now are forcefully rejecting the legacy of France Afrique, just as their forebears forcefully rejected the official French, em French Empire. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that France has at the moment. It desperately wants to retain uh, some grip, some dominance over its former uh, colony. But Nigerians uh, think it's high time that they should leave once and for all. Mm -hmm. And if hatred for France intensifies, as it is likely, then we could see a full-blown full-blown evacuations of, 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 of any French uh, people, including French soldiers, uh, in, in, in Niger. David, you were talking about uh, the possible diplomatic resolution to this. Uh, finish your thought. Yes, I mean, the, the point which I make is that, um, you know, what we're facing at this point in time um, is a clear position um, where uh, ECOWAS will have very little choice uh, but to give dialogue um, the priority. I mean, it makes in its, um, you know, as declarations that it made, it finished by saying that it does prioritize um, a peaceful means, and this is what the Nigerian uh, junta has presented. Um, again, I don't want to keep repeating this, but um, the, the, the possibility of a successful um, ECOWAS military intervention is zero. Um, one, I think ECOWAS is planning for a battle. They might possibly face a war, um, because, of course, Nigerians, you know, are much ready. Um, the population seems to be anti-war. Regional partners are supporting Niger, um, so there is no national intelligence or regional intelligence estimate, you know, of what a war would take, how long it would take, you know, how if actually it would achieve its mission. So we have to shield that uh, and focus on dialogue. But what I think is important, you know, for ECOWAS to do, is to activate um, this ECOWAS standby force, which they are doing. Mm -hmm. Because I hope that is what is done. That could be used in future in the event that, you know, there is any indication or indices of a coup in any of the ECOWAS countries, that could be deployed within 24 hours. There yeah. is no legality to do that, but they will be supported. I think that's the best way forward, okay. you know, in terms of uh, how I see things uh, unraveling. I mean. 
Abdullahi, let's talk about the United States. As you pointed out a moment ago, there hasn't been much coming out of Washington so far, but the U.S. does have a significant military presence in Niger. They have a military base there. There's about 1,000 U.S. troops there um, in the country. Uh, a new United States ambassador will be arriving in Niger possibly um, later this week. Um, what kind of involvement do you see ultimately by the United States? I mean, they already have boots on the ground. Yeah, I think for the United States, it's, it, 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 it will try as much as possible to stay away from a wave of anti-French sentiments that has swept the region over the last few uh, years in the successive countries that have undergone military coups. But again, the United States knows very well that this particular military base in Agadez is an incredible military asset for the United States. They're working every possible way to ensure that that base stays. They could move to, um, you know, um, if you will, Ivory Coast, but it will not have the same level of footprints in terms of the intelligence gathering. They could go the Afghanistan way where you, they can deploy aerial um, uh, surveillance planes, but that is never as, you know, useful as having uh, your own military base in country. So for the United States, it's walking a very fine line. But I'm glad you mentioned the question about the ambassador. It just shows the United States, and possibly some of the Western countries, have not invested enough that you're having an ambassador, you're having a place that is as critical, sitting at the cross, you know, uh, border of various geostrategic um, um, uh, reality, and you do not have a full-time ambassador in that country. Uh, my former colleague, uh, uh, my, 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 the, 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 the core panelist mentioned the gas pipeline, mentioned the French military, mentioned where is the urgency of the Nigerians? Europeans are interested in the gas pipeline to ensure that they are not reliant on let's say, uh, the Russian uh, Russian oil. Um, these other guys are fighting uh, the, 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 the um, jihadists. Where is the interest of Nigerians? And that is particularly the missing discussion in all these, what does the Russia want? What does the United States want? What? So I think centering Nigerians probably uh, is why we're missing a lot of the right. dynamics, including the domestic political reality that potentially led to the overthrow of Mohammed Bazoum to start with. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Time has caught up with us. Thank you to all of you for being with us. It's been a great discussion. Thanks again for joining us. about your life at that no, particular time? Not at all. Excellency, thank you very much for your time. What is your assessment of the state of the continent today? Africa has the potential to fight itself. Excuse me. <laughs> on the move there is my opportunity is it good to change so fast <laughs>